self-pity is sin. Self-pity is also depression, but it is sin. And when self-pity is given room, it allows the devil to replay over and over and over everything that keeps you a victim to your past and eventually, if not stopped, it will become who you are. And everyone knows those who are choosing to allow this to become their identity because all, all you hear about from them is what people have done to them, what people are going to do to them, what they think people are doing to them. Everything is brought about from a, I'm at a complete disadvantage, my life is not blessed, I'm at great risk. It is pretty continuous that this is their identity of choice. You choose to live refusing to forgive people and you're also choosing to stay stuck in misery, unforgiveness, anger, hatred, resentment, rebellion, and it can even turn into murderous thoughts to self or others. And all the while, it breaks your heart into many pieces. We all could choose this because all of us have been wronged in our lives. And the more that you get closer to Christ, the more that's going to happen. We're going to get wronged again and again and again if we follow Jesus. But we have to be careful to never open the door to the spirit of self-pity because the spirit of self-pity is a demon. And it's being given permission to take root in us when we choose to be unforgiving, when we choose to ruminate on what was done to us, the offenses, when we script right how we're going to move forward in that situation with the person, when we're passive aggressive in our responses to them, unforgiveness and anger stem from bitterness. And when we're offended, we can become bitter. We begin to think negative thoughts about the person or the people that have hurt us. And then this can lead to hatred, more unforgiveness and anger. And in Matthew 5, Jesus says, but anyone who says you fool will be in danger of the fire of hell. In Matthew 5, 21 to 26, Jesus says that to think or say something bad against someone is equal to committing murder. That's what Jesus says. And this demon or a familiar spirit to many knows what has happened to you in, the, in your past. He knows the weaknesses that you are still carrying offense in. And he will throw dart after dart after dart into that same wound because it is still surrounded and nesting in unforgiveness and offense. And the more this devil of offense and self-pity can get you to replay the hurt, the stronger this stronghold becomes in your life. You end up in bondage to deep emotional pain and this demon does not want you free and knows that when you're stuck in self-pity, you will not fulfill any of the purposes and plans that God has for your life. You will not be walking in any sense of your destiny. You will be mired in the past and it's difficult for you to even praise God for even the smallest victory because you have committed yourself to misery. People have this demonic oppressive spirit of heaviness that reminds them constantly of what others have done to them. This leads to a life of depression and sadness as a result of the heartbreak all caused by a demon that has been ushered in at your choice. It is critical to let go of the past if we are to move into a new future and into any of the promises that God has for us, that Jesus bought for us. You have to let go of the past. Or you can choose to stay trapped in this sin and separated from God. That's why you can't have both. They're on opposing sides. Demons come in groups, and the one who gains entrance first is going to help the others get in. And when the spirit of self-pity and depression calls, it can lead to this spirit of defeat entering. And this leads to a downward spiral of depression, worthlessness, despair. And when feeling worthless and in despair, this leads to all sorts of bondage, alcohol, sex, drugs, overeating, and many other addictions of comfort to solve the feelings of worthlessness that we feel. Self-pity means 
pity for oneself. It is a self-absorbed unhappiness over your own troubles and the way your life is going. It is a disagreement with God over how your life has turned out and how he has treated you. It's often seen as the most destructive force a person can choose, many times causing more damage to you than pride itself. It is a form of pride, it is a form of worship of self, and it is a worship of our need for comfort. Being angry that we have not received the kind of respect, the spouse, the job, the money that we feel we should have been given, by this we cause damage to our relationships, we cause damage to our family. Self-pity can be highly addictive, it is self-indulgent, it causes us to dwell on our misfortunes, our griefs, our sorrows, all of our losses. Anybody who's disrespected us in our own mind, anyone who possibly overlooked us, it begs for pity from others because it's looking for attention and validation at all times. It is an insatiable black hole. And this can make it challenging to overcome because it's an act that serves as mental anesthesia. It numbs pain. And instead of properly addressing whatever's causing the pain, most prefer to continue on medicating the pain by their own means. Often unforgiveness is a key holding the spirit of self-pity in place. Let go and forgive those who have hurt you and receive God's forgiveness for the regrets you have against yourself. We can recognize the spirit of self-pity in people in a few ways. One, they are reluctant to pray or ask God for help. They feel shame, grief, and unbelief. The demon within them will not allow them to come before God because it tells them they are unworthy to do so. Depression is another sign. People turn to quick fixes and the world to solve their problems, which is not going to help this. Antidepressants will not defeat self-pity and I am not against medication. This is not any kind of statement against that. It is just saying medication will not defeat self-pity. Self-pity has to be wrestled down and thrown out. It has to be resolved with the truth. It cannot be resolved by medicating it. The spirit of self-pity changes our mindset, and we hear its voice as if it's our own talking to us. It tells us that we are the center of the universe and that everything is out to get us. The spirit of self-pity is incredibly self-centered, Therefore, it takes the focus away from Jesus Christ and the worship due to him, the following due to him, is turned towards ourself. That is why you cannot serve self-pity and Jesus at the same time. You are going to serve one or serve the other, and they both end up in different places for eternity. The spirit of self-pity is a liar. It comes up with any number of excuses it tells us that the fault lies everywhere but with us. It also says don't pray at this moment because that won't work. We're too unimportant to be real, to pray, and to ask for help from others. That is what it will tell you. John Piper says the nature and depth of human pride is illuminated by comparing boasting to self-pity. Both are manifestations of pride. Boasting is the response of pride to success. Self-pity is a response of pride to suffering. Boasting says, I deserve admiration because I have achieved so much. Self-pity says, I deserve admiration because I have suffered so much. Boasting is the voice of pride in the heart of the strong. Self-pity self -pity is the voice of pride in the heart of the weak. Boasting sounds self-sufficient. Self-pity sounds self-sacrificing. The reason self-pity does not look like pride is that it appears to be so needy. But the need arises from a wounded ego. It doesn't come from a sense of unworthiness, but from a sense of unrecognized worthiness. It is a response of unapplauded pride. People don't feel self-pity when suffering is accepted for the sake of joy, only when they aren't getting the applause that they feel is owed to them. Nothing destroys a person like self-pity does. It instigates depression, it stops growth, it makes a person self-consumed, and it closes the doors to heaven for you. The consequences of false compassion, the only option for 
someone just self-absorbed in how they care for others, will end up becoming resentment. They keep a record of wrongs. They become bitter, despondent, and lazy. And this is what happens when you are in the identity of self-pity, but yet you serve others, you can easily become resentful because the motive is wrong. Self-pity is a sign of cowardice and weakness. It is evil in its purest form. A strong-minded person deliberately and forcefully destroys this malicious spirit from his heart. He will not tolerate it. A strong spirit always serves good and never will support evil. Self-pity produces fear. God has created us with an extraordinary potential that we can't even begin to imagine, but most will never fulfill even a small part of it because fear and self-pity keep them in the narrow lane of human logic, which does not allow God to enter our life and allow us to see the amazing potential he has created in us. We will not see our purpose because we're self-absorbed and this is a dead sea in here. You won't hear from God if that's where you're looking for it. The second we accept the thought that we are underestimated or offended, we lose. We slide down to the foot of the mountain and we stay there unless we repent and return to the truth. Self-pity seeks to keep you from the glory of God because it blinds people to the truth that they actually need healing. They complain for hours on end about how terrible their life is, how terrible their marriage is, how terrible their job is. But when you offer to help, they turn you down again and again and again because they make excuses to stay where they are. The spirit of self-pity seeks to turn your face away from God. It tells you to reject the word. It tells you to reject those who are offering to pray for you and help you. You need to turn your back on the world and its comfort so that you can receive healing. But many who actually stay stuck in this stop reading their Bibles. They aren't even looking for the truth. They have made a decision to stay in self-pity. It's comfortable there. Many who have followed and served Jesus for many years sadly discover that this is precisely the area of life that provokes the most bitter and most dangerous kind of self-pity. When something calamitous happens to them or their family, their response, whether they say it or not, is, I have done so much for Jesus. How did this happen to me? This hardship should have never happened to someone who's as faithful as I have been. Where is my protection? So there is great danger when you count on your personal costs from serving Jesus and your enduring of painful trials that you begin to become unhappy, dissatisfied, and accusing God over your situation. You feel you deserve better and you resent others around you who are still appearing to prosper and not have trouble. John Yount says, self-pity is a powerful negative attitude that gives rise to many, many excuses for sin. People fall into Satan's trap of giving themselves permission to sin to compensate for the difficulties and trials that they've had to bear. Self-pity is a direct rejection of God's control in your life. It is saying, I don't like what you've done in my life. I don't like what you've allowed in my life. And I absolutely will not be content. I can't change it. So I'm going to be angry and miserable. And that's the problem with People who see themselves as a victim, who are unforgiving and who are in self-pity is that they continuously look to that as their identifier and they reject the amazing freedom they could have and the new identity in Christ they could have. Every human is prone to self-pity. We are born self-centered with a powerful need to protect egos and personal rights. And when we decide that life has not treated us as we have a right to be treated, self-pity is the result. Sadly, there's very few people under proper biblical teaching that are telling them that if you belong to Christ, if you are a genuine Christian, you have surrendered all of your personal rights. You no longer have any. You can't expect any. You don't have them. You are in Christ. 
you have no personal rights. We sulk, we obsess over our hurts, real and imagined. Somehow we feel God failed us because this should not be our lot. We have not deserved this kind of suffering. The biggest clue that self-pity is not of God is the word self. Anytime we're focused on ourselves other than for self-examination leading to repentance, we are in the flesh. Our sinful flesh is an enemy of God. And when we surrender our lives to Jesus Christ, our old nature is crucified with him. There is no other option. The selfish, sinful part of our lives no longer needs to dominate because Jesus overcame that for us on our behalf. We don't even have to power that up. Jesus did that for us. So when self is dominant, God is not. And that is a choice. We have by default become our own God in that case. We serve self, which is the opposite of being a follower of Jesus. You cannot be a follower of Jesus and live by your own wishes, your own plans, your own desires. There is no such thing. And the judgment at the end of life will show they, all of those who live according to their own plans, they were not following Jesus. C.S. Lewis says, the moment you have a self at all, there is a possibility of putting yourself first, wanting to be the center, wanting to be in the position of God in your life. In fact, that was the sin of Satan, and that was the sin he taught the human race, and that is how he catches most people. The self-sins are more difficult to detect than the obvious sins, such as sexual immorality and drunkenness, because we make friends with them. Self-confidence, self-seeking, self-admiration, self-indulgence, self-absorption, self-love are all, all symptoms of the flesh nature that has not been surrendered to Jesus. So sadly, in many Christian circles, ministries, and settings, they will talk to you about loving yourself. They will talk to you about self-esteem, self-worth. All of these things oppose the gospel of Jesus Christ. They are not of the kingdom of God. They are of the world. This is where the world has mixed in with the gospel and has turned it, and it will not produce fruit that leads to eternity in any good way. Anything that has to do with making self better or fixing self or anything about improving on self is the opposite of what Jesus has called us to do. He has said, deny self, crucify self, bury self, do not serve self in any way. Deny it, destroy it, kill it. Live in Jesus Christ. The self sins, including self pity, show that regardless of what we say with our mouth, our highest worship is reserved for ourself. And when we indulge in self-pity, we've elevated our importance in our own eyes. Romans 12, 3 says, Do not think of yourself more highly than you ought to. We are thinking too highly of ourselves when we allow life's hurts and injustices to dictate our emotional state. No one, no person, no event should be able to swing us around in our emotional state. That's double-minded. We need to be firmly planted in the the truth of Jesus Christ, and he never promised us anything smooth. Bitterness can quickly override the fruit of the Holy Spirit if you do allow it to. First Thessalonians, Thessalonians 5, 18 and 19 says that we are not to quench the Holy Spirit. Instead, we are to give thanks in every single thing. It is impossible to give thanks when you are clinging to self-pity because by definition, a self-indulgent attitude is not focused on gratitude. Self-pity cannot be thankful, and being grateful is a sign of a follower of Jesus. Dr. Henry W. Wright often said that self-pity is the super glue of hell that binds you to your past. It's an unhealthy infatuation with your past trauma and your current adverse circumstances. If you are following Jesus, and you are constantly walking around, digging in the trash of your past, you need to go to someone who can help lead you to Christ because you cannot serve him when you're looking backwards. 
a project. It projects past failures into your future. And that ruminating is going to ruin your witness. You cannot exalt Jesus Christ when you're despairing in the things that have happened to you. You will begin to feel helpless, hopeless, and then you become that perpetual victim. This is self-idolatry. This person becomes unaware of the needs of others and they struggle around them. Although it may falsely present itself as self-compassion, they are actually demanding on others. So when a person like this is serving others, they actually are doing it to, to get something back. They need the feeling, they need the attention, they need um, some recognition. There's a trade going on. It is not a sacrifice for them. It may cause a person to control others out of fear, and it's often just one tiny step away from outbursts of anger and rage they're just waiting at the surface. It demands love, it attempts to manipulate others, it wants its needs catered to, and it's very capable of destroying other people. A person under self-pity's influence will often say things like this, you just don't care about me. You don't pay attention to me. You don't have time for me. You don't listen to me. It's always about the needs you're not meeting in their life. Overcoming self-pity requires that you face reality. A person who struggles with self-pity will often be quick to blame others or the circumstances around them. It is most difficult for this person to take responsibility for their actions or their life. Very difficult. Their pride doesn't let them. At all costs, this person needs to recognize this spirit's influence in their lives and they need to break agreement with it in totality. Recognition and repentance is going to take a lot of humility and courage for them. Although self-pity may act small and insignificant, it's awfully entrenched and attached to certain most people's identity. A person may have been trained in their whole life, their whole families this way. It may have come through many generations of their family. They may know nothing different than to act this way, but they have got to break this curse. Rejecting the impulse to feel sorry for ourselves is pretty hard to do, but life provides many opportunities to experience more rejection, more injustice, and more cruelty from others. Our natural response is self-protection, which often results in self-pity. However, we are supposed to walk by the spirit and not gratify the desires of the flesh. We instead refuse to indulge our sin nature and choose instead to live from a grateful heart, trusting that it is God who works in you to will and to act in order to fulfill his good purpose. Philippians 2.13. And for many of us who are a little ways into this battle, we know that the strongest parts of our ministry, the strongest parts of our what we have to offer comes out of the worst things that we have experienced in our lives. It does not come out of success. It comes out of brokenness. So there's a reason why we need to be grateful for these things as hard as that is, because it is fertile ground for more amazing ministry to come forth. We can look at every opportunity to indulge in self-pity as a chance to defeat that old nature every single chance it starts talking to you you can get prepared to war against it and destroy it we can choose instead to trust that god will work everything for our good to those who love god and are called according to his purpose romans 8 28 there are basically two reasons that people feel sorry for themselves and choose self-pity they didn't get what they wanted or felt they deserved or they got what they didn't want and felt that they didn't deserve one of the two and to overcome self-pity we need to be willing to submit every thought every pattern of behavior and our self-will completely to god we need to filter it through the word of god and recognize where is this coming from we need to be willing to cast all of our cares upon god so that he can begin to start bringing true healing into our hearts 
2 Corinthians 10, 5, and 6 tells us casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ and having in a readiness to revenge all disobedience when your obedience is fulfilled. 1 Peter 5, 7 says, casting all of your care upon him, for he cares for you. If we identify a spirit of self-pity at work in our lives that is feeding our thoughts, feelings, and emotions, we can know that is not from God, and we can po be positive that it has an ulterior motive that is not going to be good for us. It is certainly not going to benefit us. And here's some possible effects of the results of self-pity in your life. Self-pity takes the bad things in our lives brings them to the forefront of our focus, ignoring all the good things that have happened. Then it tells us that nothing ever goes well for us. We never get any breaks. Nothing good ever happens to me. And it makes these lies seem as if they are the truth. Skating over every blessing, every good thing that has ever happened. Self-pity hides the truth from us. It is occultic in nature because it covers up the truth it changes our perspective to keep our focus on the lies. It seeks to establish the lie of fatalism in our lives and makes us believe that nothing is ever going to improve. Self-pity tries to isolate us by deceiving us into thinking that we will be safe from being hurt further if we withdraw from people. Self-pity succeeds in isolating us by using negative thoughts, feelings, and emotions so that we will push people away. And this creates a vicious cycle of pushing others away and then feeling rejected because we've done that. It is self-sustaining. It can convince us that we don't need anyone else in our life. We're better off without them. Close relationships are painful. I don't want them anymore. Self-pity blinds us to our past, binds us to all the pain of our past, all the good is erased, and it does not allow us to move forward. It's like driving, as I said, looking out the back window and wondering why you keep running into trouble. It takes on a victim's role, always the victim, but not interested in a solution to being a victim or in taking responsibility for your own life. It is usually very unwilling to even search one out. They don't want to take responsibility or do the hard work of cleaning this up. It's easier to just stay submissive to self-pity. Self-pity is manipulative and it punishes others that don't give in to it or enable it. It will make others feel guilty for not bending towards it. It then questions their love and their commitment to them. It accuses, it demands honor and worship. It's always close to anger. It can always erupt at any time. Self-pity always has a place to blame for what's going on. It has to find out whose fault it is, but it will never be their own. It always has a reason why we cannot overcome also. A person with self-pity may say, you just don't understand, never mind, just forget I said anything. This is a demon, a demon that lives in you, not intended to be given a home in your body, but it is. You're feeding a demon. It feeds you in turn thoughts, feelings, and emotions that you accept as yourself and you agree with them, and then you live them out. Once we reject and remove the demon of self-pity, amazingly, you will have peace and you will move forward into restoration and recovery of what God intended for you. What we choose to listen to and agree with is going to become our reality. God offers a real solution to us to recover truth and to deliver us from this trap of self-pity and depression, we are as miserable as we think we are. Instead of self-pity, consider the great sufferings of others and especially Jesus. It appears that Hebrews 12, 1 and 2 was written for people who do want self-pity. The author has listed all the men and women who believed God through incredible suffering. They were tortured, some were mocked and flogged, Still others were chained and put in prison. They were stoned, they were sawn in two. They were put to death with the sword. They went about in sheepskins, destitute, persecuted and ill-treated. They wandered in deserts and mountains and in caves and holes in the ground. 
compare what you feel is happening in your life to their lives. And then it goes on to say, therefore, since we are surrounded by such a cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders us and the sin that so easily entangles us, which might be self-pity. And let us run this race with endurance that is set before us. Let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross. Consider him who endured such opposition from sinful men so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. We grow weary and lose heart because of self-pity and self-focus. And if we know that we are followers of one who suffered, that should change our perspective on everything. And he said, if anyone will come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross and follow me. That means that each day we choose to die to all self-interest, our self-preservation, our self-promotion, and we follow Jesus. The one who chose to leave his home in heaven, to come to earth in the lowest forms he could be, to be rejected by even his own family, and to take all of our sin and our pride to the cross so that we did not have to pay. We do it for the joy set before us. We overcome self-pity for that reason by accepting self-denial every single day to follow Jesus. You cannot follow Jesus unless you deny self every day. May we be determined to be set free from this wicked spirit of self-pity. Steps to do that would be, we have to be determined to start believing God and what he says in his word, despite what our feelings, thoughts, emotions, and our conclusions tell us. What's sad is that terrible events, grief and loss are factual. The impact on our life is factual. The damage to our world is factual. But we cannot look at that as the truth because this experience here on earth is a shape and shadow of what the truth really is. The spirit realm is where this is really being played out. We don't have the eyes to see that. The way that it's all set up what God is watching. He uses some of the most painful things in our lives to pr produce some of the most beautiful fruit a person could possibly have this side of heaven. It doesn't come any other way. Those who choose to go through that process to turn their incredible grief and pain into a vessel for the King of Kings to use to bring others to himself are some of the most admirable people you will ever meet. We have to admit when we have self-pity and only then can we start to war against it. We have to actively choose to come out of agreement with it in totality, in the minor ways, in the major ways. We have to make a solid decision to overcome it and demand it leave our house. Self-pity must become our enemy. It is not our friend. It is not a comforter. And it does not deserve a home. We must learn to recognize the thoughts and feelings that come with self-pity when they try to overtake us rather than think that feels right, that feels true, that feels normal. We must see it as an enemy of God and resist it. We must seek restoration because we cannot move forward and address the issues until we do. We have to remember who our source is, and that is not our own works, not our own understanding, not other people. God alone is our source. We have to switch our perspective from the physical to the spiritual where the real story is happening. This earth is not the real story. It may appear real, but it is not the real story. We can ask God to give us his perspective, and we can be assured that God's perspective on whatever we're struggling with is very different from ours. He knows the truth. We may feel stuck in the midst of it. It may feel overwhelming and all-consuming, but God is watching the big picture and he's watching out for us. 
He has already prepared a path of escape for us if we will choose it. We have to submit our ways to him. We may feel uncomfortable in the process of choosing to trust him and deny our hearts all these ungodly ways of thinking that are from a demon, not from ourselves. We have got to cut the head off that thing. The eternal rewards will far outweigh any temporarily discomfort, um, labor to do this, or any frustration. It will be far worth it. No temptation has overtaken you except that what is common to mankind, and God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. But when you are tempted, he will also provide a way out so that you can endure it. 1 Corinthians 10, 13. Romans 8, 31 says, What shall we say then say to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? God is on our side. He loves us completely and unconditionally, no matter what. And he does want the best for us. And he does want us all with him. And this life will have many struggles, much hardship, pain, hurt, because the world is fallen. We have handed dominion of this world over to the enemy. The reason these things happen that everyone thinks, why is God allowing this? Because man has taken advantage of his own gift of free will. That's why it's happening. It would not be free will if God were constantly intervening and cutting it off every time something looks like it's going to happen that's bad. God gave us free will, and what you see is what man has done with that. This is not God's fault. And I would suggest not blaming God, as many do, for the bad things that are happening. We are responsible for many of the bad things happening. He would never do these things. When we face struggles, trials, and tribulations, pain, and fear, we need to go straight to God. And when we try to process it in our own mind, and we try to figure it out, figure out who's to blame, fix it, we will become easy prey for the enemy, and we will become trapped. And if your loss becomes your identity, then the unresolved pain, grief, and hurt will have a natural expression from your identity, and you will become known as someone who wallows in self-pity, who's negative, who's always complaining, who speaks death, over every group that they're with, no one wants to be around these people except their like-minded kind. And then it's a competition. But no one who wants life, hope, and happiness, and freedom in Jesus wants to be around these people. Instead of processing the pain and moving toward freedom, peace, and joy, the pain and the grief and the hurt will become your normal your choice you chose it your relationships conversations and ministry will show that you chose that instead of jesus your loss is not your identity you may have experienced great loss it may have really impacted your life but you go through loss you do not become lost you overcome with freedom, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. If you make it your identity, it will be possible that you get trapped in it because it will be hard then to know who am I actually if you let that set there for a while. We see that often. People don't even know who they are. They don't have any, any idea who they really are because they're identifying themselves based on an event or something that happened. You'll always be stuck in a loop of grief and pain and hurt. And this does not mean that you forget or separate yourself from who or what you lost. This is not about that. You never need to forget them. You, you will likely never forget them. The impact will probably be with you until eternity. But if you identify yourself in who you truly are as a child of the King, you can experience the strength that comes from God to persevere through this trial, through the loss. And if you cannot understand how to not do this, you need to turn to God and the word. Your Christian mentors will help you to separate yourself from that identity unto 
I am a child of God who experienced a very painful loss. Let this work for me. Let this work for the kingdom. God make the greatest thing happen from this loss. And we do see people who do that. They lose a child. They lose a spouse. They lose a, a child in the service. Something happens and a ministry is birthed out of that to comfort other families in the same. That's how it should be handled. God will use it in an amazing way and it will bless you and it will bless many others and it will bless God. If we let God be our filter for every care, he can give us his perspective and he'll lead us away from the snare of the enemy into his peace, his wisdom, his hope, strength, and love. And we get to choose who we let be our source. Self-pity would love to be that source so it can keep us trapped in quicksand, heartache, misery. Don't let it. God can lead you through every storm so that you will come out stronger on the side, other side of every single storm. He can heal every broken heart so that we no longer have to fear rejection or being hurt again or not being able to trust again. God can heal that all of them. He can turn our perspective around so that rather than fearing man, we love them. He does not want anyone to be lost. He wants us to stay focused on what he wants. 1 Peter 5, 7 through 11 says, Casting all of your care upon him, for he cares for you. Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walks about seeking who he may devour. Those who remain, who resist steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same afflictions are accomplished in your brethren that were in the world. But the God of all grace, who has called us unto his eternal glory by Christ Jesus, after you have suffered a while, will make you perfect, establish, strengthen, and settle you. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. For those who are close to someone who's trapped in this black hole of self-pity, here's some things that you can do to help. You cannot pity them. That does not help them. Let them know that you will be their encourager, that you will help them get to the road of recovery. You can still have empathy and compassion, but do not come into agreement with their sin. Submit them to God. Pray for them in your personal time with God and ask him to give them a desire to recover and not stay trapped in this sin. Lead them to God. Don't try to fix them or be the Holy Spirit in their life. That's not going to help them. That will make you their source and you're going to become worn out and frustrated and you won't have any good fruit to show for it because they are going to demand more and more and more from you if they lay this wicked spirit down. It's insatiable. Now you're going to have to fill its place. Always point them to God. Give them truth to think on. A verse a testimony in your own life of how you had to overcome self-pity or some other person that had to overcome self-pity. But let them know they can be healed. Understand that you don't need to understand what they're dealing with. So often those of any kind of a victim mindset, they want to say, you don't understand. Nobody can understand what I'm going through or how I feel. Have you ever been through this? I don't want to hear from you. I need somebody who's been through this to understand me. These statements are designed to draw us into their misery or agreement with their misery that you're right, I don't understand. This is bad, I'm sorry, yes, I can't help you. That will not help them. We can still have love and compassion and the ability to lead others without having gone through the exact same thing. We know the one who can heal them. That's all you need to know. We don't have to devalue or cast down their feelings, but the most valuable thing that we can do is lead them to the one who did experience every manner of hardship, yet he overcame. They will find hope and restoration in the one who already defeated the problem, Jesus Christ and the love of the Father. Hebrews 4, 14 through 16 says, Therefore, since we have a great high priest who has ascended into heaven, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold firmly to the faith we profess, for we do not have a high priest who is unable to emphasize with our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet he did not sin. 
Let us then approach God's throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. So if these people lash out in anger at you, which is very likely to happen, don't take it personally. Remember, it's a demon. Don't argue with it either. You cannot please a demon. You can't argue with a demon. Let them know that you love them, the person, not the demon, and then learn how to either change the subject or graciously remove yourself until they can let go of that wrath. A soft answer turns away wrath, but grievous words stir up anger. Proverbs 15.1 Follow the example of this example in 2 Timothy 2.24-26. And the Lord's servant must not be quarrelsome, but must be kind to everyone, able to teach, not resentful. Opponents must be gently instructed in the hope that God will grant them repentance, leading them to the knowledge of truth, and that they will come to their senses and escape from the trap of the devil, who has taken them captive to do his will. Who is wise and understanding among you? Let them show it by their good life, by deeds done in the humility that comes from wisdom. But if you harbor bitter envy and selfish ambition in your hearts, do not boast about it or deny the truth. Such wisdom does not come down from heaven, but is earthly, unspiritual, and demonic. For where you have envy and selfish ambition, you will find disorder and every evil practice. But the wisdom that comes from heaven is first of all pure, then peace-loving, considerate, submissive, full of mercy, and good fruit, impartial and sincere. Peacemakers who sow in peace reap a harvest of righteousness. James 3, 13 through 18. So most importantly, submit yourselves to the Holy Spirit. Be quiet when he does not give you words to say and speak what he does lead you to say. Don't come with an agenda. Don't decide in advance what has to be said. Don't decide what the plan to help them will be. Don't decide the timeline. That's between them and God and the Holy Spirit. Self-pity can be and needs to be defeated for you to enter heaven for eternity. It does not need to manipulate you or any others anymore. The price has been paid to defeat it. God is for you. No weapon that is formed against you shall prosper. And God can turn everything that the enemy intended for evil into good for his glory. And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are called according to his purpose, Romans 8, 28. You get to choose this day whom you will serve, self-pity and depression, or God, your Father. And eternity will reflect which choice you made. Precious Lord, you are, none of us deserve you. None of us deserve anything from you. You have truly given all things. How you even love us, the way that we just abandon you in our days yet you continue to love us and care for us and provide for us and try to woo us closer to you the god who created the universe the one who is creating heaven why is there any why is it that we can't seem to just fall in submission to you I ask you for miracles for anyone who is struggling under the weight of self-pity. Any weight that is keeping them from you. I ask you by the power of your Holy Spirit for those who want to be free that you would set them free in the name of Jesus. We curse this demonic assignment against them and we ask that you destroy it for them, Jesus. Set them free. I ask that you birth revival in the hearts of everyone who just feels trapped by darkness and sadness and loss and grief, that you would build, that you would start a fire in them that gives them the hope they need to step out of that deep, dark ditch 
that you will show them that you can take that terrible event and make it into an amazing ministry for them instead. Don't sit in the dark. I ask that you help us, God. Help us to be faithful. Help us to not make you look weak and not worth it this side of heaven. Help us to be the salt that makes people crave you through our the way we live. We honor you, God. We submit ourselves completely to you, and we ask that you would help us to be who you want us to be, this side of heaven, in Jesus' name. Amen.